Hello and welcome to Access Chat. Today I'm very happy to welcome Alistair Campbell from Nementa. Alistair is someone that I've uh, admired for a long time and have uh, worked with on a number of projects in the W3C. Alistair does an awful lot of work, um, far more than I do, uh, making sure that uh, everything is understandable uh, and is doing a lot of uh, the, the, the heavy lifting on helping the Cognitive Accessibility Task Force with uh, some of the work that they're doing, as well as all of the main stuff on the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines Working Group. So um, great to have you with us today. Um, also to mention, you you know, Nomenso is a, a, a digital agency that um, I have a lot of respect for. It's done some, some great work on sort of usability, but your focus has, has primarily been sort of accessibility um, and it's it's one of the the few you know digital agencies in the UK that has a you know a really uh, a well deserved reputation for this. So welcome, Alistair. It's great to have you with us. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. So I guess uh, yeah, where would you like to start? Uh, well, that's a, <laughs> it's so a great introduction. <laughs> yeah. So so um, well, how did you get into accessibility in the first place? What was it that that, that triggered your interest? Well. Um, I'd started working in digital in a particularly fabulous time, which was 99, 2000, when the dot-com crash happened. Um, and the company I was working in uh, kind of nosedived at the time. Um, I'd started off essentially as a, a usability consultant. So I was doing usability testing, that sort of thing. And on our very first project, well, it was for a, um, a college in the UK and they said we've got this new legislation coming in in 2001 we need you to make this virtual learning environment accessible and i had no idea what that meant at the time but i was in charge of the front end code so i had to go off and investigate uh, and that was when i sort of dived into uh you know uh, accessibility standards so WCAG one at the time um and uh you know css and html and sort of looked at all these standards and went, oh, this is fabulous, everything's here. And then I tried to use them. Um, <laughs> and at the time, you know, I was working in Internet Explorer 5 and Netscape and things. So doing CSS layout was a nightmare. Um, but I, I sort of persevered and we, um, you know, as I said, I was sort of, even though I was from usability background, we just started off as a company of four people, started Nomensa, and this was our first project. And I, yeah, it was my responsibility to do that deep dive and, and work out what accessibility meant. Uh, so yeah, it was it was from that very first project. Uh, and then a little while after that, we were sort of uh, pioneering CSS layouts and things back before they were, you know, really done properly. <laughs> Well, really, really done in uh, for for sort of mainstream websites, um, and ever since then I've been doing a mix of you know information architecture, usability testing, which turned into user experience work when that term was was coined, um, and then sort of I'd say around 2008 ish, um, I started getting involved with more W3C things. When WCAG 2 came out, um, I was looking in from the outside, you know, just uh, looking at the drafts that were coming out and uh, popping comments in and seeing what happened. Uh, and then a little while later, um, uh, Nomensa joined W3C as a company. And uh, I think my first area of interest was the authoring tool guidelines. So I was obviously very familiar with uh, WCAG 2 and we were doing accessibility audits for clients, doing accessibility testing with uh, people with disabilities. Uh, and then, yeah, sort of 2010-ish, I joined the Ac Authoring Tools Accessibility Guidelines Working Group, which was an even bigger mouthful. Um, uh, and yeah, it was uh, yeah getting into the, the W3C processes, joining meetings, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and then, yeah, ever since then is, is probably the stuff you're a bit more aware of in terms of um, authoring tools guidelines were published. Uh, so I joined the main accessibility guidelines working group. Yeah. So, yeah, a little whirlwind tour of my, my accessibility um, and W3C I, background. 
And uh, it's interesting because the the last couple of weeks we have had uh, guests on, uh, up, and the topics have been around authoring tools. Um, because we had Mike Gifford on, um, uh, who, who's doing a lot of work for Drupal and, and their accessibility, and and then last week we were talking about virtual learning environments. So it's 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 kind of serendipitous that we've got you on to tie the two together now. So. Um, I'm um, very much a big fan of, of, of um, you know, stuff that's that's usable and um, and simple to use. Maybe because I'm a bit simple, um, but but essentially um, there aren't many organisations that do user experience and accessibility. We we tend to have that uh, sort of separation and segmentation. What is it that you know? Why do you think that is, and 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 how do you think we can bring the two together? Because clearly, there's a benefit for for having a, a joined up approach. Yeah, yeah. Um, it it kind of uh, comes down to how you fit the tools into the process. So, um, I, I tend to see making things easy to use is a process where um, you know user-centered design is, is the whole sort of um, you know industry approach to doing that uh, and that's that's good and useful but it, it does tend to sort of optimize for either the majority um, I almost think of it as like a sort of normal distribution and you you want to optimize this thing based on task rather than people usually you know it's based on you know, uh, I remember doing usability work in terms of, you know, buying boilers, <laughs> for example. So we're sitting people down in front of a website, trying to get them to buy a boiler, uh, seeing where they went wrong. And you tend to be able to optimize for the task. Um, so user centered design approaches and processes work really well for that. And where I see sort of the need for thinking about accessibility, is making sure that in terms of the interface and the, the content and understandability, that you're flattening, flattening out that kind of normal distribution. You're trying to make sure it works for everyone. And you can still optimize for the domain, for the task. Um, but I do see sort of accessibility as you then need to make sure you are thinking through all these other sort of niche cases. So, you know, it's where the guidelines come in. They're, they're quite good for thinking through alt text structure, um, lots of the interface elements. Um, and I think the, the sort of one of the interesting areas of work at the moment is that crossover of how do we also get people to think through the sort of different cognitive sort of abilities and aspects that, that are less obvious, uh, frankly, because a, a lot of the, the interface aspects are quite concrete and you can demonstrate, you know, you can show how screen reader works, you can show how Zoom works, how contrast impacts people, um, keyboard accessibility, that sort of thing. But I think we're, we're still kind of in the early phases of this, this crossover between user-centered design and then expanding that out to um, how people with different cognitive abilities tackle things. Go for it, Deborah. I, I'm joining from Costa Rica. Yeah, I'm joining from Costa Rica. So we had to, we had Neil's request, put a flower in the hair. So, <laughs> but <laughs> Alistair, welcome to the program. Uh, David Perez on my team, my chief strategy officer, is getting married. So we have come to Costa Rica to see uh, the wedded list. But I want to ask you, you you have already started talking about this, Alistair, but. I, um, on Access Chat, we've had people uh, very openly criticize W3C standards, and by the way, not just W3C, but all standards, saying that standards uh, aren't good, they, they stop us from being innovative, they stop us from being creative, and they get in the way. Uh, we all don't agree with that, only because at some point I have to know the framework of what you're trying to get me to do. How do I begin to do that if I don't have standards? But I was just wondering if you would mind, you know, taking, um, you know, exploring that topic a little bit. I mean, do we need standards? Do they get in the way? You know, do they make us less innovative and creative? I don't think that they do, but I just wanted to turn the floor over to you. Sure. Well, 
uh, let's consider the goal. Um, the goal is making you know websites and digital products accessible to as many people as possible. So if we start off with that goal, um, do the standards hinder innovation? Well, uh, the way they're created, and um, it, it's been a sort of topic I've been talking about a lot in terms of WCAG 2.1 was published not that long ago. You know, I've been trying to sort of um, promote how I see people should use standards like WCAG in their work. Um, and they're, they're, they should really be considered a baseline. You know, it's not um, the be all and end all of accessibility, um, but actually if you're not meeting sort of WCAG 2.1, um, or at least, you know, you've been through a new business, uh, if, if you have issues that are caught by WCAG 2.1, um, you then sort of need to make an assessment of, this is a barrier for someone. Um, we know it's a barrier because, uh, you know, the, the, these guidelines come from testing with people. They come from experts who, who watch people with disabilities interacting with digital products. So we are very confident that they, um, where things are caught by the guidelines, that they do represent a barrier. Where things get a little bit more complicated is, um, how uh, how big an issue is that barrier? So, you know, my go-to example would be if you have missing alt text on the next button in a process, that is a critical barrier. If you have missing alt text on uh, one of the partner links in the footer of a website, uh, it's a kind of tree falling in the woods scenario. <laughs> it might be the case that nobody ever notices. So um, the assessment of how critical a barrier something is, I, I think is there for discussion, and that's something an organization needs to think about. Um, but actually the, the process for creating the standards, and Neil will be very aware of this, is very conservative in terms of what gets in. So the, the working group is made up of a lot of different people. Um, so the working group working on WCA 2.1, We've got uh, people from companies like Nomensa who are sort of accessibility specialists. We've got people working for larger organizations, um, Adobe, Microsoft, um, those sorts of people. And, uh, you know, they're very much coming from the point of view of how feasible is this thing? So, you know, we added a new color contrast guideline um, and it was, it was complicated. We had to go through a lots of different scenarios. Um, and even since publishing, you know, there's still discussions going on as, as to, you know, how do we apply this in a way that uh, benefits users and is feasible to do for organizations that are large and small. And a lot of guidelines that were proposed as part of the 2.1 process didn't make it in. Um, that's you know, some people will point to that as a problem because it's not meeting user needs. Some people will say, thank goodness, because, you know, we've increased the standard by 30% almost. So there's, uh, you know, there are more things to, to check than there were before. Um, but all of them do represent user needs in some form. So, uh, yeah. And in terms of innovation, they're also written in such a way that they don't say how you should achieve them. They kind of say what you should achieve, and there are techniques and recommendations for how to achieve them. Um, but they really don't change, um, sorry, they really don't uh, say you have to do it like, like this. And actually some people complain about that as well. Um, you know, it would be easier to understand if they were completely directed and say, you have to do it like this, that would be much easier to understand. Um, but if we did that, then I think we would be, um, you know, held up as saying, you know, you're stifling innovation. You're saying we have to design in a certain way. We have to do these things. Um, and for any of the, the guidelines which do um, impact on the design, you know, we have some to do with, uh, um, you know, uh, width of columns and that sort of thing. Um, they tend to go down at the sort of AAA level. So, you know, they, they, that doesn't tend to be mandated by governments and things. Um, and that, you know, that is kind of the balance we, we have to, or the line that we have to walk um, is not stifling innovation whilst trying to um, have guidelines for things that we know have a, a, 
or of benefit? Great uh, answer. <laughs> Thank you. I, I know it's it's it, it is a tricky loan because um, a, a lot of the stuff that the that we identified as user needs for cognitive was really tricky to for for, for uh, to find ways of implementing in ways that are also testable because I think that's the other thing that that is a big part of of, of the the work out guidelines is that you know it, it needs to be something that you can prove. Especially when people are, are taking into account that this is now covered and, and absorbed into legislation as well, um, and then becomes a rather than a guideline issue, it's a compliance issue. There is this nervousness on, on the part of of large organisations, well, large and small, that if they can't test and prove that they've met this, then then they're going to be open to litigation and, and opening themselves up to risk. So. So I totally understand the, the the two sides of the argument, um, but I agree it doesn't. You know the way that it's written, despite sometimes the complexities of the language and the complexities of the process, is not intended to suppress innovation. Yeah, it's there to yeah. act as a, act as a foundation. Um, although the, the process of getting there is sometimes tough. Yeah, and you know, in terms of foundation, it's uh, I think as I said in the beginning, it's sort of using the right tools for the job, and where the guidelines are really helpful is making sure you've thought all of these different sort of niche situations through, um, and you've sort of planned them in. You know, I always tell people we you need to be sort of looking at the guidelines, understanding them, and then actually acting on them as early as you can, which is usually, um, you know, as soon as you've visualized an interface, you know, even on paper, most of the guidelines, you can then either think about uh, how it's going to be assessed, or you can define how it's going to work. So, for example, with UX designers, I'll go through and say, right, how are you going to structure your sketch? <laughs> you know, so people have sketched out an interface, could be on a whiteboard, on a bit of paper. It's like, okay, so, you know, what's the heading one? What's the keyboard order? You know, um, if you start building those things in right from the beginning, it's a very smooth process after that. Um, it's when people use the guidelines as a checklist at the end that it feels horrendous <laughs> as a process, as a, as a thing that you have to do. Um, because it, you know, all those decisions have already been made. It's too late. Um, so in that scenario, you're, you're creating lots of extra work. Um, but also going on that sort of aspect of organisations, large and small. Um, one of uh, client we've had was uh, a physics journal. So many of the sort of language aspects, they really struggled with um, for that because they have such a um, a unique audience and because um, the guidelines are used by um, governments and they sort of set those as a standard everyone has to meet, one of the criteria for the for any new guideline is that you have to be able to apply it to any website. And because we can't use words like appropriate <laughs> in this sort of, uh, you know, standard that's, that's used for legal purposes, it makes it really different, you know, that we really have to narrow the scope on what the guidelines are actually sort of trying to achieve. And that's not to say they're not useful. It's it's very good for for thinking through all these different situations. But I always recommend you know apply your user centered design process as well as this, so that you're getting that sort of um, both sides of it. You're getting the usability, the UX. You're optimizing for the task, and you're not forgetting the sort of different kinds of interface that people can use. Well, um, I, I, have, I have I have two questions. The first is how can we somehow find a, a way that people look at accessibility as something let's as something creative uh, and that enables people. Uh, you know, a little bit away from all the guidelines and rules, how we can make this more attractive. And and the other is where you see innovation on accessibility coming from today. Yeah, it's um, they're kind of two sides of the same coin, aren't they? And it's actually getting easier to talk about these things now, um, thanks to um, a lot of the work 
um, some of the bigger companies are doing, like Apple and Microsoft. So um, things like Siri, I believe, was you know based on um, at them having bought a particular company, possibly Nuance. I forget the names. Um, you know, which was created for people with mobility um, issues and RSI and those sorts of things. So um, a lot of the work that people do to make something input agnostic or um, kind of multimodal in terms of visual and audio, anything which is really adaptive is going to find mainstream uses. You know, we're seeing all sorts of voice interfaces come around now. Um, so, you know, a lot of the um, long, you know, <laughs> long term, you know, coming from academia, coming from um, disability organizations, a lot of the interfaces created are now becoming mainstream interfaces for particular uses. Um, and I think, you know, I, I suspect everyone has seen Microsoft's, you know, in, um, inclusive design toolkit, which goes through the um, permanent temporary situational disabilities. Um, so the, you know, um, a lot of the um, sort of mainstream interesting interfaces these days are based on things created for people with disabilities. So uh, there's a very easy line to draw in between innovation and accessibility. And it's it's becoming really highlighted by things like, you know, um, Xbox um, accessible controller went uh, almost immediately into the Victorian Albert Museum in London as a, as a design thing. Uh, so again, it's very easy to sort of draw that. But I don't know, the, when talking to clients, uh, you know, sort of national level organizations and that sort of thing, um, that's the aspirational side. But there's also the general robustness principle is kind of like my my favorite argument when I'm talking to designers and developers is if you consider accessibility, your digital thing is going to work in more places than it would otherwise. Uh, it means you're not just sort of designing for yourself, you're designing for a wide range of usage and more people will use your thing, whatever it is. I, I, I think um, I definitely want to echo what you were saying about the, the innovation that's coming from the large companies. I was lucky enough to go to Future Decoded last week, which is Microsoft's big thing in the UK. They had Sachin Nadella come on stage and first words out of his mouth were talking about diversity in tech, closed his speech with a, a bunch of videos around um, the assistive tech that they're putting into uh, Windows and Office 365. And on comes Jenny Lay Flurry um, to talk about accessibility, followed by um yeah another keynote speaker all about um you know disability confident so the three keynote speeches at the top microsoft conference of the year in in europe all on accessibility of innovation of course they're putting the microsoft ai angle on it but you know fantastic what a great message right from the top um and i think that this is really you know clearly showing the overlap between um, the utility that people with disabilities get from having the assistive tech, but also the um, the crossover, like you say, with uh, with all of the voice interfaces, etc. Antonio, you had a comment. You well, know, uh, you know, um, organization like Microsoft, others, you know, uh, uh, have a, a certain size, and they have people all over the world. And sometimes, if you don't have people who manage organization from a leadership point of view coming up and, and talking about this at the major events it, it's quite difficult to pass that message to everyone there's going to be somewhere or a developer somewhere at, in how to at microsoft that was oh I, I never heard about that so it's very important to to have that message coming right from the top Absolutely. I think it's quite hard to miss these days, you know, because there, there's so much messaging coming out. It's, it's very positive and it's, it's, a, it's a good thing to see. Yeah, they must see it as a competitive advantage. Otherwise, this wouldn't be happening. No, no of course. But uh, and, and, and it's something that, that I'm also used to position my own organization as, you know, as one of the areas where we think differently as a large uh, IT integrator. 
there aren't many that that have the kind of focus that we do on accessibility that, that run things like apprenticeships and 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 contribute to to all of this kind of stuff because generally it's in the weeds but but actually if you think about it we touch millions of users you know even in the in, even in the mundane stuff where we're delivering people's sort of daily desktop computing experience you can make that a lot better by understanding the accessibility tools that are built into into windows and all of the other assistive technologies that people use and having a plan on how to deploy that manage it and all the rest of it that that can make a significant difference to people's lives so um again as some of this stuff becomes more and more embedded uh it it's going to be something that more and more people use because actually it just makes life easier you know it's not yeah. i'm using this because it's specialist tech and i can't you know uh, I, I can't even count the number of times i've gone and done accessibility training in an organization um, and try to get people to open up, you know, just basic tools like a magnifier on their laptops and their infrastructure provider, I'm sure not yours, um, has stopped them from, you know, opening up a magnifier or changing the accessibility settings. And, and then you sort of take people through that on, a, on, a, on another laptop and they're like, this is great. You know, I, I want to change my default zoom on, on my browser and, and those sorts of things. You know, I've done accessibility testing where a lady with Parkinson's disease uh, was, uh, you know, we had, we had recruited because of her mobility impairments, but she was looking through the, the sort of visual help um, for changing browser settings and was like, oh, this is great. I'm going to use this. Um, and I think just as, you know, it, if we've got that sort of inspirational messaging at one end, I think more people become aware um, and those simple things at an organizational level and a personal level suddenly become a lot easier. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's true. And, and there has been this tendency to lock everything down. Uh, and, and, and some of that's an education process because people are obviously security conscious, um, but we need to educate people uh, that, that actually, you know, you don't need to lock down accessibility tools. You know, they're understood, you manage them right, and, uh, <laughs> and they're useful. They help productivity of the overall organization. It's, it's been great chatting with you, Alistair. We, we're at the end of our half hour. Um, I need to thank our friends at MyClearText again for doing a great job with our captioning and also uh, Barclays Access for continuing to support us as we approach our fourth birthday. It's, uh, it's been a a long and, and, and enjoyable journey. So thank you very much. And, and we, we look forward to you joining us on Twitter. That would be great. Thanks, uh, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Alistair. Our pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.